Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we're running short on time, so what I'm going to do is kind of try to speed things up here. Um, so, three great panelists here, um, Ken, Peter, um, Yorko. Um, you've got their bio, so I'm not going to give you a lot of time because most of you have heard them introduced before in one form or, or another. So I think I'm going to get right to it um, here. This whole idea of commerce in space is a, is a topic that's been near and dear to my heart for like the last 30 years, 40 years, something like that. Um, and I have to say that it's changed a lot, and I have the pleasure to say it's changed, in, in my opinion, in a very positive uh, direction here. So what I wanted to do today is spend a little bit of time talking about what are the, what are the opportunities that are out there and kind of what's changed that, that has brought this about, but then also address some of the challenges that still remain out there and, and looking at some of what some of the opportunities and, and maybe some ideas about how we might address some of those those challenges. So, so I'm going to start off, um, give each of the panelists, starting with, with Ken, and then go to Yarko, and then Peter, I'll give them a chance to make a few opening remarks, and then we'll start off with some questions. So, Ken? Perfect. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Is this thing on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ken. I work for the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation in Washington, D.C. There's about 80 of us, um, and most of us work on making sure that the uninvolved public is protected from the re-entries and launches of um, non-governmental space vehicles. The other five, ten of us work on encouraging, facilitating, and promoting the growth of an industry. And so the big question I've been dealing with since I took this position six years ago is how do you grow an industry? And if you ask the entrepreneurs how to do that, they say, give me money, please. And which is fine, it might be the right answer. But a lot of good work has been done in the management literature primarily about how to grow an industry. And that's what we've been doing is trying to understand what's, what's involved with growing an industry and doing the appropriate things for our country, for our citizens, to grow that industry. So as part of that entire big picture, I run a nine university um, consortium called the Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation that we do non-proprietary R&D that will help support the industry grow in general. It's not just the US industry, it'll be the industry worldwide. Because all the research we do is made public, and we're doing research that might look like what NASA's done, it might look like what Russia's done, but we're actually doing it on a wider range of people. People that have, let's say, heart disease, or back and spine problems, or we're looking at low cost ways of doing things, not necessarily higher performance ways of doing things. So we're doing things a little bit differently, specifically aimed at helping the industry grow. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yaroslav Kustovi, and uh, I can tell you that I never thought I'm going to join the commercial spaceflight industry of some sort. Uh, my background, uh, I am with military, I was selected as an astronaut for the Ukrainian Space Agency, and I worked at the Space Agency, and then about 12 years ago, it's a sudden turn. Uh, I joined one of the X-Prize teams from Canada, Canadian Aero, and that completely changed my perspective for what can be done in space, what are the prices of what can be done in space. It was a uh, mind-blowing and uh, lifetime experience already. Uh, one of the examples I want to say that uh, although the government does not support the uh, propulsion work in Canada, uh, the Canadian Aero was a, uh, a team at the X Prize, so we were able to do whatever we want to do as long as it's safe for the public. Uh, we restored, rebuilt, and successfully tested over the course of a year and a half. The original V2 engine, which is uh, for one second 57,000 pound of thrust, it's a liquid propellant uh, rocket engine. It is the largest such engine, the liquid propellant uh, rocket engine ever built in Canada. And I can tell you, if this is the thing that can be done by the team of uh, motivated volunteers, just imagine what Canadians can do for money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Peter? Hi, Peter Stabrani. Um, so there, you know, we've done a, a lot of thinking about commercialization of space, and, uh, and of course, to a large extent, there is a, there is a very large business today in space, in communication satellites. Um, I think I saw a, a survey that said something like $20 billion 
that you're generated by the by the leases on the transponders of the collective communication satellites. That's that's quite a large business. Um, being also interested in the development of space and, and, the, and the settlement, eventual uh, long-term settlement of space, I look at it though and I say, well, how is that kind of helping? And it, although it's a great business, um, and MDA does a land office business there as well, um, it's not clear to me that, that it's leading to anything. Um, then now there's a huge excitement in the commercial industry around um, remote sensing and Earth observation. And as you know, uh, Skybox and Google got everybody really excited with their $500 billion, $500 billion deal. And that convinced a lot of investors that actually, yeah, there's a, there's a market for highly differentiated business intelligence information, uh, that this information can be generated from uh, looking at the Earth from space. Because there's a huge number of startups. There's a, a great hive of, of activity, uh, probably particularly in Silicon Valley, but it extends uh, well beyond that. Um, and hopefully that will lead to some constellations. Uh, again, I look at it and think, uh, okay, but in terms of settlement, uh, sort of the kind of commercial thing that I'd like to see in the future, again, it's, it's kind of uh, restricted. Um, same thing with, uh, similarly with launchers. Uh, it's, it's a great illustration of how government needs to initially both be the customer and perhaps also be the the chief uh, implementer, and then hand over the implementation to industry, still be the customer, and eventually then uh, private industry is both the customer and the delivery. <coughs> what I've discovered though is that in order to get development, you need something that we don't have in space currently, which is spare time, spare equipment, and some resources. Because lowering the cost of trying something new is what leads to, to real innovation. So uh, that's what I've been kind of scratching my head about, is how do we create uh, systems which, uh, which can fulfill their business case, meet their expectations, but not be 100% utilized. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think one of the themes that I've, I've gotten over the last couple of days that, that have kind of resonated in several of the sessions was this idea of public-private partnership and, and kind of the opportunities that that's had and some of the success stories, but, but also um, some of the challenges. So if you guys could, could kind of address that, what do you see as the opportunities for the government and industry to work together? And how do you think that that could work best? And, and what do you see as some of the, the challenges or changes that you would recommend to be made um, in that area? The public-private partnerships are vital, I think, to the development of the industry. However, there are some changes, I think, that can be made that could optimize the partnership. Um, so things like COTS have been absolutely fantastic, and you know we can keep going down the line with all create public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships are a method of doing the business. When you start talking about space industry firms around the world, you'll notice that some of the firms working in the industry are entirely owned by the government. Some are partially owned by the government, and others in other countries are not owned by the government at all. So it's not the fact whether they're owned by the government or not, but it's how they work together. So one of the things that I think is being done today that isn't necessarily optimal in terms of PPPs is the fact that the government agency that's entering into the partnership has a specific goal in mind that has a public purpose. And it might be a uh, space exploration goal, um, it might be something that does not necessarily have a commercial purpose. And entering, bringing an industry partner into that partnership serves the mission goal of the agency, but it's not necessarily helping the industry develop. It's taking the industry that wants to be, that should be going towards some sort of nebulous market demand that may or may not exist right now, probably doesn't, and it's pushing it toward a goal that the government wants it to do to fulfill a public good, which is great, it's noble, but it doesn't help develop the market. So if the government could end up taking, you know, taking a little bit of liberties maybe and saying we're going to do this, we're going to pursue a goal which actually helps the industry goals to itself, I mean, pointing toward an industry goal as opposed to a mission goal, I think that would help the industry a lot more because right now, in a lot of ways, I think the industry gets diverted to serving the government's needs, which aren't necessarily the same as the commercial needs. National security needs are totally different sometimes than the commercial needs, so it's, it's it's sacrificing some control of the goal to help the industry develop with help. Okay. 
Uh, I would probably add to, from a little bit different perspective from the other side of this equation, from the guys who are still in the trenches. The, uh, another term for commercial space like industry is called new space. Well, when you go to the public and say, hey, I'm in new space, they go like, what happened to the old one? <laughs> so when you have to explain that it's uh, not like old is bad and new is good, it's just a different business model. I would say that a new space company is any company that's in space and has a business plan other than I'm going to build this thing and force the government to buy it. So the first, first task for you as an entrepreneur, if you want to start a new space company, you have to have the idea and you've got to develop some sort of business plan. You've got to know it's going to make a profit. You cannot rely on the government to rescue you because nobody want to buy this uh, device to build. So uh, the other part of this equation is important, the mindset of people in the space industry to understand that while you can now do whatever you want, you're no longer constrained by all these uh, government's restrictions and specs and whatever. Uh, government is not buying the system, buying, government is buying the service the system delivers. But at the same time, now you, as a private uh, entrepreneur, you uh, bear all the responsibility for the success or failure of your venture. So anyway, government uh, will only support, and I would say create, the environment for such firms to appear. But the main legwork is on the entrepreneur side. I, I have to agree with, uh, with uh, both uh, Ken and Mirko on this. Um, I do think that in many industries, in many fields of endeavor, PPPs are a way that um, government can avoid uh, the technical risk uh, and the political embarrassment of overruns and delays and that sort of thing. So they move all of that risk into the implement, uh, from the implementation of the private sector um, that arguably can be more efficient um, in, in doing this. But again, if it's, if it's just to meet a government objective, uh, that's kind of limiting. On the other hand, uh, maybe there's another style of PPP that's possible in which um, someone, there is an entrepreneurial business case, there are investors, but there's still the risk of uh, not having the first customer. And the idea of a PPP in that case, which creates a uh, first customer out of the government for, um, to, to kind of give confidence to uh, other customers that it's okay to come on board because this is very likely to happen now. Um, I think that's another valuable uh, thing that uh, government can do through PPPs. Okay, so let's carry that stream forward a little bit. So clearly if you're going to do that in the government, one of the things they can do is um, is raise money. A, a lot of the comments of, uh, of the last couple of days have talked about having, having skin in the game, being able to raise private money and to get private resources, you know, that are at risk to, you know, at least augment what the what the government may be putting in as part of this. So, what do you see um, as the changes in the investment community or the attitudes there in that that community towards towards space? And, and it seems to be changing. Um, do you think it's changing fast enough? Do you think it's changing enough, or is there things that could be done to uh, to make that uh, to enhance that capability for the? Uh, to attract the investment community? I, I think that there are definitely areas like communications and now Earth observation where it's, I, I don't know what government can do by way of adding money. Um, I, I think it's a question of other kinds of support. Um, and I think that, the, that the, um, the market for information has been so stimulated by the evolution of the internet and the ease with which you can crunch, store, and distribute uh, information and get customers. I think that's created that, that pull from, uh, from investors. Uh, there are other areas where clearly there's not yet the confidence. So it's a completely different story there. I think uh, that in this particular area, uh, helping private, private uh, entrepreneurs to raise capital for their, for their startup or whatever, I don't think the government, it's my, my personal opinion, I don't think the government can do much here. 
Uh, because mainly is that when you want to first uh, sit down, you build up this very specific presentation, you go to the investors, and they look at you, what you can do, and they judge whether what you trying to sell them is viable. So uh, this is uh, this is only time. Uh, the truth is that uh, just about 12 years ago, when I joined Canadian Arrow, if you go to any meeting and you mention new, new space, you want to fly uh, something on your own, uh, they think you're crazy. Uh, then you change a little bit, okay, you're not crazy, but it's still not doable. And when they hear that, okay, uh, you want this kind of money for, for your venture, they think, yeah, probably business plan works and everything is great, but I want to call my brother-in-law who happens to be working at NASA and ask his opinion. And he calls and says, and the guy says, no, no, it's not doable, it's, it's all only, only government can do. It's, by the way, called brother-in-law effect. Uh, so, uh, but right now we see more and more instances, uh, granted they're not fast enough, uh, that uh, more and more private money going into this area, I can say that the first brave soul probably was Paul Allen, who funded World Rutan. He gave him, what, about 20, 20 million dollars to win the million prize. Uh, Richard Branson believed in the same technology and uh, a lot of people investing their own money. And I would say this is probably the predominant way of funding new space business, is when people who already have money start this business themselves and fund themselves. So uh, when the institutional institutional investors will come to this equation, I don't know. I hope soon enough, but uh, I guess it will take time. The space, the new space, must become uh, mainstream, and only then the traditional investor investing community will uh, take notice of it. Okay. Um, so so let's move a little further out. Um, yesterday we had some discussions about both. Uh, the moon and uh, the asteroids. And there's companies out there right now from Shackleton to Goldman Spike to um, Google Lunar X Prize guys to Deep Space Industries, Planetary Resources that are have some pretty audacious business goals is to basically go out and harvest the resources of the solar system and try to find a way to make money. Um, what are your thoughts on their prospects? You know, what is you know that a bridge too far or is that uh, something that, that's uh, in the realm of possibilities, how do you how do you um, handicap that for the future? I'll start with this one. Yeah, on the last one. Okay, so new, uh, deep space industries, planetary sciences, I think is very very interesting. I think it is farther out a little bit, and because it's farther out, I don't think you're going to see private investors of real size jump in because the initial innovations in that in, in those types of ventures, I think, are still forthcoming. They're still very basic. So it hasn't attracted the private investment community yet. Getting back to the previous question, you've seen sizable private investment in the remote sensing, you know, small constellation sector, in the suborbital sector, in the Earth to orbit sector um, for space transportation. Even to some extent, I think, and I could be wrong here, on the on orbit spacecraft sector. I'm not exactly sure how much private investment has been raised there. And private investment is the key here. It might be easier to go to the mon to the government and say, please give me money. And they might give you money, but it's going to be, again, for the public good, which is great. But it kind of lowers the bar for the survivability of the firm. It might be harder for to get over that bar to survive till next year if you don't accept the government money. But by getting the private dollar, now they're giving you that money because they, they believe in a commercial um, market for your service. It's almost like a badge of honor to get that private sector funding. And so the fact that I think that the planetary sciences, the deep space industries, the asteroid mining stuff hasn't necessarily gotten a whole lot of, I haven't heard of private investment pouring into those types of industries in Shackleton and whatnot. It's sort of an indication, I think, that we're still early on in the cycle there. Uh, it'll come, but I think it's not the first markets that are going to fall. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, uh, those are interesting um, those are interesting business uh, cases and plans. I, I think to, to some extent they, they're still depending on customers who can only appear after the supply is available. So it's a classic chicken and egg problem. And in this case, um, I think there is room for, for government to play a role uh, and uh, forgive me the pun here, 
if it's chicken enough. <laughs> um, in other words, uh, if, uh, if government were to say, okay, well, uh, let's put it this way, if you, if you make uh, certain resources available, we'll buy them. Um, to, to be something of an anchor customer. Again, not to fund the whole thing, because that would then bring so many strings that you never get off the ground, but, but just enough to make it interesting, just enough to give it more credibility, um, as, the, as the XPRIZE uh, has done to many of these uh, ventures, they've just given publicity, they've, uh, they've made it more credible, uh, more reasonable for people to think about it. So I, think, I think those things government can really help with. Um, and then it will really be up to private industry and uh, to, to make the rest of that business case. I think the part of the problem here is that uh, while we're talking about the deep space uh, kind of business, um, it is cool. I mean, it's mind blowing, and uh, of course, uh, probably in I don't know, 30 to 50 years, it will be great. And uh, the first millionaires will probably uh, build their fortune on that. But uh, uh, you know what? In order to to run, you have to learn walking, and before that, you need to crawl out of the primordial loose. And this is and this is in regards to commercial space life industries where we are. We are struggling to get not only to orbit but to suborbit. So, uh, in my view, that's uh, that's part of the problem for these companies. I'm not saying they they're completely wrong starting it right now, but uh, I don't know all the details of their business plan, maybe there is some secret to it. But uh, it is, I see it extra, extra difficult to convince the investment community or even the government to buy into this idea right now. While we still don't have means to travel to this asteroid, how are we going to mine them? Uh, I, I hope for the best of this uh, firms uh, that and it will happen. I just am not sure when. I want to add a knife about it. Okay. Um, like space science, um, I think that the crowdfunding community is rising to the occasion. You look at the million dollars or so that are created by planetary sciences. So I think that's the way it's coming. It's coming in the little bits, coming in through the crowdfunding thing, which is a great mechanism. I've had a lot of time thinking about how do we relate to the science side of this. Things like the B612, 612, so 612, the space science activities that we want to do. Planetary science has kind of lots of big surveys, it's kind of the space science activity. There seems to be a great, great level of support like that where a lot of individuals at the $10, 20 level can really pitch in and make that possible. So there is a level of support there. It's more not out of a commercial motivation, but at least there's a funding mechanism that can be had to help those uh, early stage kind of activities. Cool. So, and, and let's kind of go back, you know, because one of the things that, that you guys I'll mention at one point or the other, and that is something like prizes. So do you think that, um, and, and Ken, you were heavily involved in, in prizes for a while with Centennial Challenge, do you think that prizes could play a role in this as far as demonstrating the capability to, to do some of these things and then, you know, hopefully um, uh, a business can grow out of that? Now I know we started off with the, with the uh, Ansari X Prize and, and back in 2004, and everybody thought, oh, 2008 will be happening in this, and here we are in 2015, and we're still struggling. So, you know, space is hard, and, and it takes a little longer, but do you see that, that prizes can play a role in, in helping to stimulate some of these industries? Prizes absolutely can play a role, not in every case, but at, and they already have. I think in the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge that was run out of the NASA Centennial Challenges office, I think is, you know, obviously, NASA is still there working, doing science missions for uh, Draper Labs. Uh, you've got, well, Armadillo kind of disbanded, but they're coming back in Exos. And so there's a lot of activity that was going on then. Unreasonable Rocket uh, is coming back, you know, yeah. from the X Prize days. So there's a lot of things that are still happening, and I think the prizes can be used. I think it's a great way to stimulate public interest, to, to pull people out of the woodwork for our Bee Power Challenge when we did, ran that out of NASA. We had a lot of Canadian company, our university teams coming and really participating, and they were the strongest participants of them year after year. So I think it's a great way to, to, to make it a very public activity. I think what that does is it helps with the legitimization of that technology in the mind of the public. It, it kind of mainstreams it, and the goal, one of the biggest things to make an industry, uh, to grow an industry, I talked about that a little before, one of the main things that you've got to develop, which a scientist and engineer doesn't even bother thinking about because it's so insignificant, is legitimization in the mind of the public. You have to legitimize it. You have to make it kind of mainstream 
And to do that, some of that involves marketing, some of it involves demonstrations, and I think the Centennial Challenges and other prize programs help to demonstrate the technology, demonstrate the coolness factor of the technology that all the scientists and engineers and all the space fans here kind of take for granted. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there is definitely a, a, a normative kind of idea aspect to, to uh, prizes that, that works. Uh, one of the things that it, it doesn't do is it doesn't build a business case. Um, you have to have one in order to actually participate in a, in a prize. Because, you know, everybody loses money on those things in, in terms. <laughs> if, if, they're, if, they're done, if they're done well. <laughs> um, but um, one thing that you do need is you need to figure out what the business case is. Now, in, it's not all about technology. And, and I, I have this kind of uh, unquantified feeling that today our problems are not, or not problems, the, the thing that we need to, to, to overcome, the, thing, the issue that we need to resolve, is not really technology as such. Um, the technology is really just a proxy for credibility in some sense. But, but in the background, there's a lot of technology. And I'll give you an example. Uh, today, we have a lot of interest in, uh, you know, well over $100 million invested by uh, uh, by private investors in, in low Earth orbit Earth observation. Um, but the technology has been there for at least a decade to do at this price level, at this cost level, at this performance level, uh, to build these, uh, these devices. And, and so it's not that as soon as the technology is available, boom, suddenly you have uh, investors. That's not how it worked at all. And, and so part of the, um, the, part of the puzzle is the rest of the ecosystem that you need. And in the case of Earth observation, the rest of the ecosystem is the information sphere and the business associated with information and the relatively recent discovery by uh, private industry that you can make vast amounts of money out of moving information, particularly differentiated information uh, to, various, uh, to various places. I think that, uh, uh, well, prices are great, um, I don't think you will ever see the effect of the original X Prize to be repeated. Remember, X Prize was uh, uh, designed after the Ortiz Prize, which was the prize for aviation. It started the, the aviation industry, and the X Prize was the first, and it, because of it was the first, uh, and the idea was completely fresh. For some, it was completely crazy, but eventually it worked. And the result was great. You now have a lot of uh, teams who transformed into the commercial companies. Uh, I don't think you're gonna, you will see the repeat of this uh, effect, maybe to a lesser scale. But uh, right now, it's up to uh, entrepreneurs to take advantage of uh, this exposure that Price gave them and move on and uh, start raising capital for their ventures. So we're just about out of time here, so I'm going to give each one of the panelists like one minute to uh, to kind of give their thoughts on, on kind of if you could change the world and you were king for a day and you could do one thing, what, what's the thing that you would like to do there to to encourage this uh, commercialization of space? Oh God, that's, I'm going to have to try to figure that into what I wanted to say. Okay, so what I wanted to say, and I'll get to that, what I wanted to say was what Peter said. Peter said two things that I think are pretty profound very great observations which are backed up by research. Number one, that the technology is not the problem. It's not, the problem we have in front of us is a business problem. It's a socio-economic problem. Uh, there's been research that was done, Gerhard Mensch, econo uh, economist, uh, he wrote about how it takes 50 to 100 years from the first time that something is invented to the first time it becomes a product. By the time the product evolves, 75%, a vast amount of the knowledge that's required for that product to be, to be um, developed has already been discovered. It's sitting in some government you know, file cabinet somewhere. It was discovered 50 years ago. It's sitting there. You can get it for free. I mean, like you said, it doesn't, it's not like it, it happened, the, the discovery happened yesterday or the technology was developed yesterday and then the product comes tomorrow. It takes 50 to 100 years. Now, how to speed that up is a good, good, good question. And it's not a technical question. So it, it's going to boil down to, and this is what I would change. A lot of engineers think, boom, I've got a better mousetrap, I've got a better flight, uh, launch vehicle, I've got a better something or other, and everybody's going to want it. So come on, I'm open for business. And it, that's not how it works. You actually have to sell it. So and if you invent it, they will come? Yeah. 
Yeah, it just doesn't work. We've got to sell them. This is why America mastered the art of marketing and selling. I mean, this, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And so you've got to get down there and get out of the scientific and engineering field. We've got to start, I hate to say it, paying more, and I don't hate to say it, I hate to have to admit it. Because I made fun of business majors when I was in college. I'm, I'm making fun of it. I'll, or I'm, I'm making fun of it now, and I'll admit it. But we have to take advantage of what they've done and the skills they bring to it. So the social sciences were something that were highlighted yesterday and the need for more social science in, uh, pro, um, provision into what we're doing. That's why I'm getting a degree in business these days and I feel like Gunter the Monkey from Futurama if you saw Mars University. <laughs> You've got to expand out of the economics or out of the engineering sphere and get into the, the real world where you have to um, diffuse this innovation and maximize the uh, rate of adoption. So, uh, I think that uh, it is important to understand that new space, uh, commercial, uh, commercial space like business, it is not a rocket, it's not a spaceship tube, or it's not a space station, or a space suit glove, or anything. It is a business model under which you, as an entrepreneur, take great decisions to first get into it. Uh, then uh, you develop a business plan and then try to sell it. Technology, as Elon Musk actually showed us, came second because he got the money, he was able to hire the specialists. So um, it is uh, a business model, it's entrepreneurial, and uh, I can tell you, if you're not completely sure, better stay out of it. The disclaimer, new space is great, but don't try it at home. <laughs> it can be extremely dangerous to your financial well-being. It can kill your wallet. <laughs> but if you disregard this, Godspeed. <laughs> I don't hear you. Okay, well we're out of time, so please help me thank the panel.